Most Nancy Drew fans don't like the Nancy Drew dossier games. All of my videos for the dossiers don't get a lot of views. People generally skip over them because they're not that interested. I think the dossiers are okay. They're not great or anything, but they're not terrible. The story, characters, and puzzles are fine. I think if the dossiers had been done in the style of normal Nancy Drew games, fans would have liked them better. Or at least fans probably would have liked them better than Ransom of the Seven Ships, which was sandwiched in between the two dossiers. It's kind of unfortunate that her interactive released three unpopular games back to back to back. It must not have been a very good year for them. So the game is done in this black and white NAR style, and I do not like that style. I, I really don't like it, but I will admit it looks pretty. The artwork is well done. But it's also done in this cartoony 2D style, which definitely looks like a step down from the main series. There is an opening animation that shows off three different scenes, and one of them's this cartoon of a guy drowning in quicksand. Why is that even in this game? I, I don't know, it's weird. And then we have two scenes. Uh, one is a black cat in the prop room, and the other is the car from chapter 19. Those feel like scenes which were originally going to be in the game, and then they were recycled for this opening animation. I don't think it's the best introduction to the game, honestly. Just three random scenes? Eh, whatever. So, we start with naming your save file, because this game has an autosave feature. The autosave works well, I think it's well implemented, and it's a neat idea, but I am going to complain about it later on. Oh, don't worry. I'll be complaining a lot in this review. The story is that Nancy's in Hollywood to help a movie producer named Molly McKenna. Somebody's sabotaging their set, which doubles as an abandoned theme park. The movie producers hope to reopen the park as Pharaoh Land. It's a terrible idea to make a theme park out of a movie that hasn't been finished yet. If the movie's a huge failure, the park will be doomed. Every chapter of the game starts with a short scene of Nancy walking across the map. I really don't like the map thing. First off, it's boring to see Nancy walk dozens of times. Second off, the game already has two different screens that appear at the end of every chapter. That's a good enough transition between chapters. We don't need a walking animation, too. But mainly, I dislike the map because it's a map that players can't interact with. The game is teasing us with this map we don't get to use. You never choose where Nancy goes next. She goes to the next location automatically, and I don't like it. I prefer the normal Nancy Drew games, where you can do things in any order you want. It would be so much better if you could pick where to go next. And that's what I would say about the autosave feature. Get rid of the autosave feature and the chapters. Do we really need seven minute chapters? That's about how long the chapters are on average. No, no, no. I think we need open exploration instead. It wouldn't be too hard to implement that. You visit each location two or three times. There's plenty of places where a clue in one location unlocks a puzzle or a conversation somewhere else. Really, I want free exploration, the ability to go wherever I want, whenever I want, instead of having the game hold my hand the entire time. We start with Nancy going to the soundstage, where she has a tutorial. It explains how to play. You click on an item to select it, click on another item to pair them together. For example, use the masking tape on a poster to put the tape on a poster. The bubble interface is okay. It's got bubbles! It's weird. It's kind of weird looking. It takes a while to get used to it, but it's okay. I think they didn't need the bubbles. They could have done this game without bubbles. Here's an example, the next puzzle. You have a light bulb. You have to pull it down with an arm grabber. You fix the end with pliers. Then you use the arm grabber to put the light bulb back into place. That doesn't need bubbles. They could do the exact same puzzle with the pliers and arm grabber as inventory items. That would be easier and feel more natural, which is why pretty much all casual adventure games have inventories instead of bubble matching challenges. Yeah, the bubble thing is weird. 
I would much rather have an inventory. There could have been an inventory at the bottom of the screen. I actually counted. There's room for at least 10 inventory items there. You could free up space by narrowing the menu button. That's twice as wide as it needs to be. Get rid of the journal. That's useless. There's never any need to check the journal. I would also get rid of the goal in the lower right. That doesn't help. The chapters are so short, you don't need constant extra reminders of what you're doing. Instead of an inventory, we get icons. I don't like those either. The eye icon lets you look at things. That's kind of unnecessary. Because you automatically get a close-up of an item when you click on it, that should be enough. We don't need a close-up of a close-up, and I'm unsurprised that the second dossier game gets rid of the eye icon. The other useful icon is the hand that lets you interact with objects. I guess it was overpowered because the next game splits that up into four different icons and completely gets rid of the other three. The other three icons aren't so good. I would definitely get rid of them in order to have an inventory. The flashlight icon barely gets used. The lock and decryptor icons both start minigames, so those could be removed. After all, the smoothie and bomb minigames don't have a special icon to trigger them. Why do these minigames need icons? The next puzzle is to fix the intercom. When Nancy does that, she calls Molly, who forces her to fix the generator. We are interrupted by a tutorial that says you can click on a selected item to deselect it. That's useful in places like this, where there are 11 items to find. It's definitely easier to find all the items first before you start making item combinations. I guess they call it a hidden objects game because you have to find items. I prefer normal hidden objects challenges, where there's a list of all the items you must find. You know exactly what you're looking for. Instead of that, this game tells you how many items are left, which isn't helpful. If my wife told me to get 12 things from the store, but refused to tell me what those 12 items are, it would be impossible for me to get her order right. And so it is with this game. Since you don't know what you're looking for, you have to guess. I get stuck when there's only one or two items left on the screen. I can't find them because I have no idea what they are. The game becomes a boring pixel hunt where I slowly move the mouse over every part of the screen until I come across the right item by accident. This problem is especially bad in the hotel lobby and crow screens where there are lots of tiny items to find. So yeah, I'm not a fan of the interface in this game. I would much rather have it be like a normal Nancy Drew game as opposed to having bubbles instead of inventories and finding hidden objects instead of actually doing stuff. Most of the game is just finding hidden objects, isn't it? Once you're done, Molly appears and we get the first conversation challenge. This is simple. There are five options at the bottom of the screen. You pick the correct one. There's no penalty for wrong answers, although you get more points if you get correct answers. I'm fine with the conversation puzzles, but I understand the critics who think the conversations are forced. And clunky. Unlike the main games, you have no choice when it comes to what Nancy says. I'd love to ask Molly about the other characters, and I would love to talk to George about something other than smoothies. We don't get that chance. The game forces us to talk about these random things. The conversations are limited because they always have to have a correct answer for Nancy to pick. That means most of the conversations are Nancy talking about things that have already happened. It's like the game is giving players a quiz to show they were paying attention. That's not how conversations normally go. The conversations would instantly be improved if there were actual dialogue options for players to choose. They could be put after the conversation puzzle. You know, Nancy does a conversation puzzle, and then she can talk about three or four other things before leaving. I've seen other games do that. It works perfectly well. Molly's okay, she's got a good design and great voice acting, but there's nothing interesting to talk to her about. Most of this conversation is her complaining it's expensive to film at night. She doesn't introduce herself or explain the case or anything. Thanks, Molly. 
The conversation starts with an animation of Molly saying, Nancy, nice to meet you in person. I hope you enjoyed those three seconds of animation, because the rest of the conversation is pictures of Molly's face. The picture of Molly changes throughout the conversation. She's got an angry face, a confused face, and so on. I think it's fine, but it's definitely a step down from the main Nancy Drew games, where every conversation is fully animated. Only 10-20% to 20 of the conversations in this game are animated. It's like they originally planned to animate all the conversations, but they didn't get too far before realizing it was way too much work. So they scaled back to only having animation at the start and end of each conversation. They did a little bit of cheating within those limits. You'll notice some conversations start with two or three word sentences. Hmm. I think the conversation pictures should be bigger. They're about a fourth of the size of the animation frame for whatever reason. They could be improved if each character had more facial expressions and if they changed expressions more often. Say, once every sentence, not once every paragraph. Molly asks Nancy to get an onk. She explains there's a black cat which distracts the crew. Nancy will chase after the cat for a good part of the game. It doesn't affect the plot, but it is a good excuse for Nancy to visit new locations. That's the end of chapter one. Every chapter ends with a done stamp appearing on the goal, while the screen fades to black. A purple pop-up window appears telling you the chapter name. I think it'd make more sense to put the chapter's title at the start, not the end. That's how books do it. You see how many points you earned? Points from the mini-games, puzzles, and conversations are counted separately for some reason. After that, you're taken to the detective ranking screen, which shows how close you are to unlocking the bonus ending. Not really, though. It shows a yellow bar that fills up as you get more points. I wish the game said outright how many points you need to get the bonus ending. Chapter 2 starts with a tutorial saying you can click on the goal button for more information. Since the goal button is useless, this is double useless. Right now, the goal says you want to find an onk. The more detailed goal says you want to find the onk on this screen. Wow, thanks for the extra help. Nancy cleans a crate. Inside is a hieroglyph clue and batteries. It's a bit confusing because those two items overlap. So after you look at the clue, it turns into batteries. They should have separated those two items. Use the batteries and the flashlight so you can look in the small, dark area. The next time you use the flashlight is an hour from now in Chapter 14. The flashlight is used so rarely, it did not deserve its own icon. In the dark area is a bobby pin. You use it on the door for the lockpicking challenge. This is the minigame you play the most. It's okay, nothing great. You have to form different shapes with the tumblers. The colors have to match, and that's where I always get stuck. Like, whenever I need a blue tumbler to finish a design, the game will give me 15 red and yellow tumblers instead. I don't know how the game decides when certain colors appear, but they definitely needed to pre-program that. You have to do too much waiting to get a specific color. Luckily... This is less of a problem in the first half of the game, where you only have two colors. Once they add the third color, the puzzle becomes more difficult. Nancy is distracted by the cat, which is on a statue. There's a puzzle to fix the statue by turning off the power and using tools on it. You have to unlock a door to get the tools. I'm not sure why we have two unlocking challenges back to back. Nancy follows the cat into an office where she's distracted by a key. Then we get a tutorial about bonus points. You get bonus points if you make multiple correct matches in a row. The bonus max is out at 500 points per match. This feature's okay. This is a bad screen to introduce the idea. There are two keys and two locks here, and there's no clues indicating which key goes with which lock. You're forced to guess, giving you a 50-50 chance of losing your bonus streak. Nancy cleans up trash for gum, which she uses on a coffee cup and a pencil to get the key. I like this puzzle. It reminds me of the gum puzzle in the final scene. I also like how the book in here is written by Charlena Purcell. 
The small references to other Nancy Drew games are nice. Inside the desk is a threatening letter from George. He wants revenge for what Arthur did. We don't know who George and Arthur are yet, so this clue doesn't work at all. The phone rings. Nancy answers it, which makes no sense. She's breaking and entering right now. She shouldn't answer someone else's phone. Does she want to get caught breaking the law? The caller is Arthur. He wants Nancy to return to the set. It's never explained how he knew Nancy was in his office at that particular moment. Even odder, Nancy says nothing in response. I wonder why they included this scene. They didn't have to. Nancy planned to return to the set anyway. I guess they wanted to introduce Arthur, but it's such a weird half-done introduction. I don't get it. We get our first bonus round! All the bonus rounds are the same. You have 45 seconds to match numbers. If you make a pair, the number is added to your points. If you make all the matches, you get 10 extra seconds and you go to a larger board. It's hard to get past the third board of the challenge. Chapter 4 starts with a Molly conversation. It's all Nancy recapping what happened in Chapter 2. Five of the six prompts are about what Nancy just did. I don't know why so much recap is necessary. She wasn't gone that long. Molly says to check the scaffolding. You need to match the pipes with the holes based on the shape of the hole and whether the pipe end has prongs. This puzzle has three rounds that gets harder each time. It's a pretty good puzzle that makes use of the game's matching mechanic. When you're done, you get more hieroglyphs, a bead, and a shaved bolt. Which sends you to chapter 5, I don't like this one. You have to build a ramp on the set in order to chase the cat. Wouldn't it be faster to go down the hallway? As always, the entire thing proves to be a waste of time as the cat runs away and Nancy goes back to what she was doing earlier. The only important thing you see here is a paper, which says Arthur's got a decoder. You use the paw prints on the paint bucket to find the paint bucket. Yes, the paint bucket is used to find the paint bucket. It's weird. There's a key in the paint bucket, but you don't use the hand icon to grab it. You use the eye icon to grab it. So you grab it by looking at it? That doesn't make sense. Maybe that's why I don't like this chapter. The start of the chapter has some confusing stuff. The rest of the chapter is okay. Use the wood on the table saw to cut it. Unlock the cabinet for nails. Use the hammer and nails on the wood to build a ramp. Nancy must be a master carpenter because she builds a pretty sturdy ramp in a short period of time. Nancy then goes to the wardrobe where she reads a tabloid article and notes from Molly. Nancy decides she should clean up because she's the production assistant. You're not, Nancy. That's a fake cover story, remember? Nancy puts items into three lockers using the mannequins as a reference. It's an okay puzzle. I like how she uses a whip to get one mannequin head. That's cool. The screen fades to white as Nancy cleans up the area. She finds a bead, figures out which locker is Ida's, and then we get a scene of Nancy cleaning up. It's a little weird. There's a 20 second gap between Nancy cleaning up and a scene of Nancy cleaning up. I would have shuffled things around in this chapter, so the scene of her cleaning up actually happened when she cleaned up. Nancy meets Ida Brooks, who quickly proves herself to be stupid and self-centered. I don't like how the third question of this conversation challenge requires players to remember who wrote the tabloid article. Talk about a minor detail that players have to remember. Ida tells Nancy to visit a local restaurant called the Caspaw. As soon as Nancy enters, she's forced to make smoothies for everyone. This is probably my favorite minigame. It's fun! You drop ingredients into a glass as they move by on the conveyor belt. Unlike the other minigames, it tells you exactly how many glasses are left for you to fill. The whole time you hear some interesting and amusing gossip from the crew. I also like how you have three different orders to choose from, and there's no penalty for missing one. So if you don't want to make a drink with four ingredients, you don't have to, you could just skip it and move on to the next one. Nancy hears George Jackson, the director, likes rattlesnakes. She uses this as an excuse to introduce herself. George denies being angry with Arthur, which is a lie. George is mad at Ida because she refuses to hold a snake in the movie. 
he blames Molly for the accidents because she cares more about cutting costs than safety. Molly's cost cutting is an interesting angle, which the game doesn't follow up on. That's the last time we hear about it. Nancy snoops in Arthur's office. The hat hides a key for the cabinet, which has a closed luggage case with a shaving brush inside. Why does Arthur have so much protection for his shaving brush? He has a beard. He doesn't shave. The shaving brush goes on the chalk outline. I assume the outline is fake and no one died here. I wonder why he leaves something so creepy in his office, right by the chair where visitors sit. Maybe Arthur hates visitors. Nancy uses the chalk on a nine-button lock for a fingerprint challenge that we've seen in other Nancy Drew games. It's a solid puzzle. This gives her a note, which has to use the decoder on the movie poster. Nancy finds the decoder under the floor, and we get a simple puzzle where you answer riddles about the movie, and you match hieroglyphs with letters. Nancy meets Arthur for the first time. I like his design, and he's a friendly character. I think he's fooling himself to believe Pharaoh Land will be a success, but he's definitely the nicest person of the game. Arthur gives Nancy a lockpicking kit. This sort of makes me wonder if this scene was originally supposed to happen earlier in the game. There is no noticeable difference with the new lockpicking kit. The icon is different. That's it. That's the only difference. Arthur says he secretly hired Nancy to find lost footage from the original movie. The lost footage includes Lois's death. He sends Nancy on a two-chapter mission to check Molly's hotel room. In the hotel lobby, Nancy sees the movie poster. Using the decoder on it spells out, Find the Najahaji. Nancy doesn't follow up on this clue for another seven chapters. I already complained about this! But I wish we could choose what order Nancy investigates things in. It's definitely a lead I would have followed up on right away. Nancy refuses to use the hotel elevator without a disguise, so she has to make a series of strange matches. Put the candy in a jar to learn the fountain's operating hours. Use a cane on a clock to start the fountain so you can fill a watering can to use on a plant for a glass eye. Glass eye? Was Bruno Bollet here? Put the eye on a fish for a key to a display with a hat. I guess the puzzles make sense, but they're weird. I don't like this area too much. Nancy lockpicks to get into Molly's room. The puzzle here is to find the computer password. You remove a pen cap with the eye icon. That's weird. You remove the cap by looking at it, not by touching it. Inside is a note, which says half the password is on the bathroom mirror. Inside the boots is a note that says the other half's on the TV. Remove batteries from the toothbrush to use on the TV remote. You put the two password halves together. Nancy writes the password down on a piece of paper by the computer. There is no dialogue or anything to indicate the password's now on the table. Players have to notice on their own that a new bubble's appeared on screen. On the computer is a trashy-looking website called The Pharaoh Files. I love how it has a silly-looking animated picture in the sidebars. It feels like the web designer just learned how to put moving pictures on websites. Nancy reports back to Arthur. She informs him Molly has no taste in websites, and he admits he pulled some strings to minimize George's pay. Nancy goes to the prop room, where she's interrupted by a puzzle to unlock the editing room. This feels out of place. It would fit better in the next chapter, where she goes inside the editing room. The key to the room is hidden by some glow-in-the-dark paint, which is probably not the best way to hide something important. The prop room is a huge mess. Nancy has to put things away in the correct spots. I like this better than the puzzle in the wardrobe, even though they're the same basic thing. In addition to matching things with boxes, you have a handful of other puzzles, like opening the sarcophagus. Nancy discovers that somebody's taken an explosive called Flash Boom. Molly enters. She confirms explosives are dangerous. I like how she says, Ida's got the mental capacity of a grapefruit. That's a funny line. And as always, Nancy gets told where to go next. Chapter 12 is one puzzle. You use the data chip icon on the data chip, which is sort of like using an item on itself. This gives us the decryption puzzle. Which reminds me of Tetris, played sideways. You want to rotate and drop pieces to fill the gaps. You have to complete 20 rows, 
with under 20 mistakes. It's all a waste of time. The video footage shows the culprit used a cloak as a disguise, so we don't know who the culprit is. Nancy returns to the wardrobe. Somehow, there's a tabloid article about Ida's new security system. How did Ida install the system and get it publicized so quickly? It's only been 15 minutes, right? Nancy uses the powder puff to reveal lasers, redirect them with a mirror, remove the four dead light bulbs for clues about the correct order to push the locker buttons in. A snake is in the locker. I wonder how it got past the security. Nancy has a minor puzzle to move things around and go through Ida's stuff. I kind of like that puzzle. When Ida asks why her locker is open, Nancy confesses she's a private detective. No, Nancy, why did you blow your cover like that? You could have used the snake in the locker as an excuse for opening it. Ida says Lois had the valuable jewel of Karnak, which disappeared when she died. Ida thinks somebody's spying on her at all times. It's creepy. In the next chapter, Nancy uses the snake wrangling cane on the nine snakes and lizards that are moving around the screen. It can be hard to find them because they're moving, but I like this puzzle. When it's done, Nancy finds evidence that both George and Arthur were in here recently. She finds cat food, which indicates somebody's keeping the black cat around on purpose. And she learns Najahaji is the name for the Egyptian cobra. Wow. Nancy sure learned a lot in this minor snake hunting chapter. She should hunt snakes more often, I guess. Nancy returns to the hotel where she repeats the hieroglyph puzzle for a series of musical notes. She talks with George. He seems to know more than he should, so Nancy decides to break into his room. Oh, Nancy, you're not going to see George again until the end. You don't need to bother with this guy anymore. That's sort of how the game treats him. George really just disappears from the rest of the game. Poor George. Nancy has to turn off the fountain to get to the employee ID number, which is used on the phone. This reveals the rug hides the key for a rocket sculpture for the button to the security panel. Just like the previous hotel lobby chapter, we've got some weird decisions when it comes to the puzzles. Nancy uses the security panel and does decryption again to get the code to George's room. Why does George's room have better security than Molly's? Chapter 16, that's the next chapter, it's called The Lobby, which is weird because it takes place in George's room. Maybe they had it confused with the previous chapter, I don't know. Nancy looks in a boot for Arthur's credit card. George has Arthur's credit card, that's another plot point which the game doesn't follow through with. You use the credit card on the TV to open the mini bar for batteries and you use them on the camera for film. Nancy has to develop the film in the photo lab in George's bathroom. This reminds me of the photo lab challenge in Danger by Design. I don't know if it's better or worse, because it's a 12-step process, but at least you don't have to find items in the dark. George has secret pictures of Ida's shoulder. He thinks it's some kind of Egyptian curse. It's creepy that George is a stalker, and this ends up being kind of a joke. Ida's shoulder mark is a scar from a tattoo removal. George was freaking out over nothing. It's a pretty funny way to resolve George's story. I would have liked some resolution to the George-Arthur tension, though. The ending acknowledges George was mad at Arthur. That's not resolving the story as much as it is restating the story in different words. Ida and George go missing. Molly and Arthur argue over whether or not to call the police. Nancy looks for them at the Casbah. She does a smoothie challenge again. This time there are double-sized glasses. Nancy hears Ida and George are at the docks. Instead of going there right away, she decides to waste ten minutes fixing the smoothie shop. That's not your job, Nancy. On the right side of the room, she puts things away, fixes the microphone, and breaks glass at 25 hertz for a new digital decryptor. Now it works with audio files. Going from video downloads to audio downloads seems like a downgrade to me, but who cares? On the left side of the room, Nancy puts things away and preps the piano. You have to play the music notes from the movie poster, which is an okay puzzle. The song is pretty nice. I like it. The song is named after the ship at the docks, which confirms you want to go there next. The docks are next to Arthur's office. But I guess Nancy doesn't know how to walk around buildings, because she does a puzzle with the statue instead. 
This is the only time Nancy has a puzzle that deals with the abandoned theme park. It's a decent puzzle, so it's kind of a shame we don't see more of the abandoned park. It could have been a good setting. As it is, the theme park is so irrelevant to the game, you could get rid of that angle completely, and the game would not be any different outside of this puzzle. Nancy finds a paper which has the statue as part of a car ride. She picks the lock of a nearby car and fixes it, the ride starts, and it seems like a cool attraction. It reminds me of Roger Rabbit's crazy car ride. The statue shoots the car's tire, causing it to crash into the wall. Now, Nancy can go to the docks. She uses the decryptor on a broken phone to learn the blueprints are hidden here. Nancy finds the keys to a chest, which has a hook inside. She lowers the hook into the water and snags the box with the blueprints on her very first try. They are so easy to find, it's amazing no one got them earlier. The blueprints say the original set is under the house on Main Street. This leads to the crow puzzle, my least favorite puzzle of the game. You have four minutes to match 32 objects by color. It's too many objects to keep track of for me. You have to spend a lot of time finding all the objects. Since it's so dark on this screen, you can't see the color of an object without zooming in on it. So there's a lot of guessing involved. If you fail the challenge, all the bubbles and items reset. So you're forced to kind of memorize where the bubbles are and what all the items are. It usually takes me a couple of tries to solve the challenge. And also, the crows have white bands and silver bands. They look exactly the same, but the game forces you to treat them as separate colors. Chapter 21 has a similar annoying puzzle. You have to light all ten candles before time runs out. I guess Nancy forgot the flashlight she had earlier. This puzzle is easier than the crow puzzle because you can find all the candles and activate their bubbles before you start the puzzle. Once you light the candles, Nancy sees a golden sarcophagus with a fancy lock. She also sees the stolen flash boom. Nancy leaves and she finds Ida. Ida says Arthur has a secret safe with something super secret and super interesting inside. Now that Nancy has practically been told to rob Arthur's safe, that's what she decides to do. Just like Molly's computer password, there are clues to the safe digits scattered all over Arthur's room. His safe has bolt cutters, that never gets explained, and it has the phone number for the tabloid reporter. Nancy returns to the filming area where she has to use a ramp to reach the set. She did that earlier. Why doesn't she reuse that ramp? This time she uses a prop as a ramp. She opens an arc with a decoder riddle for the sarcophagus key. I don't know why I never really liked this particular segment. But the rest of the chapter is great. We see all four suspects argue with each other over what happened. This is a highlight of the game for me. It's a fun scene. The characters have a lot of personality, and everyone has a big secret that gets revealed. If only all the other conversations in the game were as good as this one. George is spying on Ida. Molly confesses she put the snake in Ida's locker to scare Nancy off the case. Ida confesses she's been feeding the cat and playing up the curse rumors for publicity. Arthur confesses he caused all the accidents for publicity. Nancy returns to the sarcophagus for the endgame challenge. She has to light all ten candles again. I don't like how they reused the challenge that I didn't really like the first time around. Nancy does the lockpicking challenge on the sarcophagus, and we learn about the excavation minigame. This one's okay, although like lockpicking, you can get stuck because the game doesn't give you the color you need. You have to drop bombs and matches into the playing area. If a match touches two bombs of the same color, they explode. Otherwise, the match fizzles out after a while. This minigame also reminds me of Tetris. Why do all the minigames involve dropping things and making matches? The last area has another time challenge where you find things in the dark. It was such a terrible challenge earlier, I don't know why they did it again. Admittedly, this is a better variation of the challenge. You want to move shiny things into the beam of light. You do it seven times, and Nancy can see the room. Nancy goes to the left for a Lois puzzle. There are 16 symbols on the wood. It's kind of hard to see them all, because they're so small. According to the paper on the ground, you need to spell out Lois's name with birds, rain, scorpion, 
and pyramids. The puzzle does start out kind of tough, but it gets easier as you go along when the pieces are removed from the screen. Once that's done, Nancy gets the lost footage. Ida is revealed as the culprit! She was hoping to get her hands on the Jewel of Karnak. She decides to become rich and famous by murdering Nancy in a cave-in for publicity. I think this ending's okay, but it's a shame they directly copied it from Nancy Drew last train to Blue Moon Canyon. I was hoping for something more original. If I had to compare the two endings, I would say the train game did a much better job. Nancy has to do three rounds of the excavation challenge. It's sort of a competition with Ida, as you can blow up crates to make rubble fall on her side of the screen. You don't have to. Really, Ida is so bad at the game, she often loses on her own. After this, we get the ending. Nancy watches the lost footage, which shows Lois Mason did not die. She faked her own death, and no one knows what happened to her next. If you got the bonus ending, it's also revealed Lois stole the Jewel of Karnak. Arthur recovers it, and the film's a success. In the regular ending, the film is a flop, and he's forced to sell the property. So really, Arthur is the only one who's affected by the bonus ending. The other characters have the same ending in both versions. Molly adopts the cat, Ida avoids prosecution by having a conveniently timed nervous breakdown, and George hopes the movie fails, because he's too dumb to realize that will wreck his career. The tabloid people won't stop hounding Nancy. She jokes she'll let her dog answer the phone from now on. <laughs> That's it for the game. There's also an arcade mode, but I don't think the mini games are that good, so I never play it. So that's the first dossier game. I think it's okay, but it feels like I criticized it more than I complimented it. I would definitely find the game easier, better, and more enjoyable if it had traditional hidden objects challenges, an inventory bar instead of bubbles, and open exploration. Those are the three major changes I would make to the game, which would make it more palatable to fans of the main Nancy Drew series and to fans of hidden objects casual adventure games. And those are my thoughts. I give Nancy Drew dossier number one, Lights, Camera, Curses, a 6 out of 10.